you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I am Ritwich. Um, I run a company called Spikey. We are a data visualization company based out of Bombay. We've been around for two and a half years. And uh, essentially, we build visual representations of large data sets. Uh, we work with different types of clients. We have core businesses which want to analyze data and take better decisions. We work with data journalists. And last, we work with software product companies to embed visualization into their products. Uh, so, yeah, we have clients in six countries. Some of the clients that you might recognize include uh, First Post and First Biz, they are part of Network 18. Uh, Visually, which is a, we are partnered with Visually, uh, it's a very famous data visualization company in the US. And Journalism Plus Plus Color, they are the guys who build data wrapper. So, we work very closely with them too. Uh, so, uh, during the talk, I'm going to cover data visualization. I'll start with really the basics, uh, then go deep into the fundamentals. And then I'll cover two case studies where we apply this. So, how you should be actually visualizing data. Uh, what are the principles? What is uh, what? What you should be looking for in the data, and then I'll cover challenges in data journalism and what are we doing to uh, solve them. Great. So let's start. So let's start with the pie chart. It's like the most basic thing that one can do, right? And so here you have uh, the data for the pie chart, which is like E has 38 percent and D has 25. So basically, the objective of a pie chart is to break a hole into parts. Right? Let's look at the data behind this. We call this as like it is one dimensional data out here, and you are breaking a circle by the visual encoding, which is area. Sorry, okay. I have to be the. So uh, let's look at the terms out here. You have dimensions. Uh, when you have data, dimension is the column by which you. Uh, actually, one second. Uh, how many of you are developers and how many are journalists? Developers? Yes. How many are developers? Okay, and the rest are journalists. Okay. So uh, dimensions are columns by which you aggregate data sets, and facts are columns, uh, generally numbers, which you count, sum, etc. Right. So uh, you should always first look for uh, uh, dimensions and facts in your data set. So let's look at this data set. Uh, seat count by party. Party is a dimension. Seat count is a fact. Seat count by party and state. Party and state are dimensions, and seat count again is a fact. Uh, so this is the idea of dimension and fact. Now let's look at various visual encodings. The idea of data visualization is that you're going to take data and you're going to uh, visually represent it using various visual encodings that your eyes can understand. These include uh, area, position, color, length, thickness. Right. So let's go, go back to our pie chart. So at Pikey, uh, we follow this model called as data first, design later approach to make this, uh, to design our data visualizations. Um, and the first step is actually building a categorization of various standard charts and graphs. So we call the pie chart as a one dimensional chart. And you know what? It might have been just a amoeba kind of a shape out there broken by area and it'll still be a pie chart. Let's extend the concept further. All of these are pie charts, right? So what do we learn from this is that the same data can be visualized in many, many different ways. But what chart should you be using for what business case changes a lot. So if you're representing Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you should use the triangle. If it's sales data, it's funnel. If it's election, it's election donut. Right? So, uh, but the data set behind this is absolutely the same. So this is an article from Hindu. Uh, it's a very cool pie chart which is like leaning against the wall many colors, etc. But what is wrong here? They've not done it right. The wrong thing is that they've used color and color is communicating absolutely no data set. Right? Next, it is 3D. 3D too is communicating no data set. So ideally a pie chart is focused around one visual encoding and that is area. The only visual encoding that you should be using is area. All your slices should be the same color. And uh, right? So the moment uh, your idea, the objective of using data visualization is to communicate data. And when you start using wrong visual encodings, you will not be able to communicate your data in the first go. Right? And a lot of these principles are already covered in data wrapper, like your pie charts are always the same color. This is another pie chart. Uh, what is wrong with it? Well, uh, there is way too much of values. right? It's not readable at all. Um, and so what does this teach us? That area encoding has its own limits. You can't have infinite values in area encoding. 
right? So uh, how how sh how should you be solving this problem? A, if you have more than five slices, you should combine all of them into other. If you still need to zoom in, click on the other, and there should be another chart coming in, right? So let's look at another data set: seed count uh, by party grouped by alliance. So now we are adding a new concept: grouped by alliance. And let's say I had this bubble chart with me, where I had party, and the radius of the circle is the percentage. Okay. So now, if we start adding color, that is the alliance is plotted using color, it becomes a grouped one-dimensional chart, right? So we now used color to communicate data. So uh, you can always add an extra dimension into your standard charts and graphs. Uh, by communicating it um, uh, using colors, so use colors very effectively. Right, uh, which party won in which year? Let's look at this data set. Now, this is a two-dimensional data set. You have parties, you have parties and years. So the years and parties. Plot the dots, and you have a two-dimensional data set. Um, are you getting the concept of dimensions and facts? Okay, right. So connect these lines, and now you have a line chart. All of these charts are exact; they represent the same data set. There's absolutely no difference between these charts, right? Uh, so what is again? So uh, you should start by looking at the number of dimensions in your data set. What is? Uh, what are the dimensions you're going to use? And that will tell you which chart you should go to, whether to go to pie charts or to go to these charts, right? Let's look at which party won in which constituency by what vote margin. We've added more data now, and we had this uh, scatter plot. Now, what we are going to do is add add weight, that is vote margin. So now we just make that dot into a circle. The radius being the percentage vote margin, it becomes a weighted two-dimensional chart, right? So the concept of groups and weights are something that you can keep using again and again, and they'll communicate different things. So uh, right. So you can always fit an extra fact into your standard charts and graphs called as weight, okay, and use and communicate it using size or area. Um, right. So this is a weighted scatter plot. This is a circle comparison chart. They both are exactly the same. Let's say the data set was which party won in which constituency by what vote margin group by alliance. Now we have group and weight, and it's a two-dimensional chart. So we'll add color, grouped, weighted, two-dimensional charts. Right? These are multi-series two-dimensional charts. Uh, when the dimensions start increasing beyond two, you have to use these group, stack, percentage area, uh, grad charts, multiple lines, etc. Uh, well. Let's look at this example. This is a story from Livement. Uh, is the equities rally percolating into the broader market? So what they are trying to say is uh, the story is around this. Uh, the BSE small cap. There is a light blue line behind it. Uh, the story is about that line, but that line, the color used is very bad. So the BSE small cap lines is not visible at all, and that's the story. So this is visualized not in a good way. But there is something that they have done very well out here. They're starting the axis from 90, uh, y axis from 97 and not from zero. And uh, why? Uh, well, the purpose of a line chart is to communicate trend, whereas the uh, purpose of a bar chart and column chart is to communicate discrete values. If the purpose is to communicate trend, and you start your uh, y axis from zero, then I think some 60% of your area of your chart will go into actually drawing the line from zero to 97. That area is wasted. And then you have only like 40% of your area to show the trend. Since the trend is not zoomed into, it'll, uh, the minor variations will not be visible. So, line charts you should try to start.
Now, the whole company is divided into multiple regions, north, south, east, west. The percentage of maximum revenue is coming from west. Then you have south, uh, east and north. Then west is further uh, managed by various, various area sales managers. So I quickly know that west uh, is broken down into area sales manager 4 and 5. They have various sales officers within the, their data. So you can quickly identify what percentage of my revenue is coming from exactly which sales officer. Right? This is a weighted tree chart. Weight, weighted grouped tree chart. These are relationship uh, charts or graphs as we call it in developer terms. These are really complex data sets generally used for things like social uh, network mapping or mapping the routers of the internet or uh, identifying how uh, uh, epidemic is spreading. So uh, again, very complex data set, but again, this can be represented in all of these charts, right? So you have multiple options. So what I'm trying to communicate here is till you don't study your data, you will always plot your data on bar charts, pie charts and line charts. You need to find these relationships and properties in your data to really identify what you should be showing, what chart you should be using. This is an example of a Sankey chart, which is a weighted grouped multi-level relationship chart. Right, so let's take uh, one example, uh, Mumbai local, the, the train, suburban train, uh, fare chart. Now typically all the stations are essentially a, a graph, right? Uh, I can go from, I don't know if you're aware of the Mumbai geography, but I can go from Andheri station to the other station, get down, do some uh, run an errand, uh, get back in and then go to church gate. But typically it's the same line, so Andheri to the other is the same line, right? So uh, it's a graph in a nature, but the business case is adding a limitation that since the starting point is Andheri and the ending point is Churchgate, I just have to buy a ticket from Andheri to Churchgate, despite the fact that I'm taking a detour at the other, right? So the limitation here is it's a two-level relationship and not a multi-level relationship. And the moment we realize it's a two-level relationship, you don't need to put it in such an ugly format, which is very difficult to read, right? So you start putting it in a matrix. Uh, so, uh, what I'm trying to communicate here is identify limitations in your business case which you can leverage to improve your design and communicate it better. Okay. Next that I'm trying to uh, say here is uh, most matrix charts have this symmetry about it. right? So ABCD is out here, ABCD is out there and you're plotting the uh, fares across these stations but now you have let's say uh, a and C out there and C and A out here. So there is symmetry. That data is useless. So you break the matrix chart into a half matrix. Do not add confusion. Do not add redundancy in your communication because it just confuses. Do I start from here? Do I start from there? Right. And actually it's a matrix chart. If you look at the Mumbai local fare outside each station. So data visualization as a field, we think of it as something new. It's always been there, right? It's it's all around us. When you look at the Delhi Metro, how the you know you go from one line to another, it's always been there. That's that's a data visualization. This is a brilliant uh, chart. I really love it. It's called the chord chart. It's a weighted two-level relationship chart. When do you use it? Let's say if you want to see the number of passengers who are flowing from one station to another station, right? So let's assume if this was green colors and dairy and the black color is Churchgate, then this so many people are going from Andheri to Churchgate. What is the black to black again? So many people are entering Churchgate station and exiting Churchgate station. So uh, it's a weighted two level relationship chart. This is the breakdown of charts according to us, the standard break charts that you find on D3. Uh, why do we have the breakdown again? You start by studying your data, right? And you identify uh, where you should be moving. Right, uh, this is fine. One quick point I want to cover is uh, the dimension of time. Some charts are aggregate charts. So if you're creating the data for it, you're aggregating all your data for it. So like you can, you can never plot a pie chart across time. You can never plot a map across time. You can never plot a relationship chart across time. Right, because the axis itself is not existing. So that's something worth noting. These are the various visual encodings that your eyes will understand. It's a nice uh, 
breakdown given by Noah Elinsky. Uh, he's a designer at IBM now, I think. Right, so let's take a first case study. We, we did this for first post. Uh, the work given to us was, can you visualize the cricket scorecard? And we started looking at uh, various cricket scorecards across these various news portals that are there. And all of them are extremely text heavy. And they have so many pages, you know, the current scorecard, you go to one page, you go to full scorecard, you go to another page, you scroll down, you scroll up. So. Uh, what we realized is that this is not the right way to do it. So first thing, um, as I mentioned, whenever you have a uh, thing to do, uh, a visualization to do, you first start by breaking your data set. Your data set out here is pre-match you have toss, playing 11, location time, post-match is who won the match, by how much, man of the match. You have per batsman statistics, per bowler statistics, uh, second run innings, uh, fall of pickets, partnerships, ball by ball commentary. Right? So it's a pretty large data set with a whole lot of dimensions. It's like if you uh, start plotting it without understanding these dimensions, there will be a lot of uh, way too many charts. But we realize one dimension is very important, time. And time in cricket is denoted by the unit of overs. Right? So that is the common de denominator, that dimension is the common denominator across all the other data sets. One over has many balls, one over as one bowler, one over as many batsmen. The existence of batsmen across overs is partnership. The end of that existence is fall of wickets. So the common denominator is overs. And then we started plotting it. So what we did was we put the overs in the uh, x-axis and the balls in the y-axis and started writing down one, uh, one run. So first over, first ball is one run. First over, second ball, four runs. Now wickets is a very important event, so we started writing it in red. When there's a dot, it's not a very important event, so we just put a dot, dot ball. Right, so we started writing all of this data down. Then what we did was we started plotting partnerships. So let's say batsman 1 is batting from over 1 to let's say 8 or 9, right? Uh, batsman 2 is from 1 over 1 to over 2. So their partnership is still over 2, right? You see the uh, parallel lines existence. And what we've effectively done is, uh, we used the weighted two-dimensional chart of circle comparison, right? Where the y-axis is, uh, where the x-axis is overs plus bo uh, bowlers, y-axis is balls per over. And if you hit a four runs, uh, anything about three runs is a very important event, four, five, six. Those have a higher heat. Dot balls, one run, etc. have a lower heat. So it's a weighted, the weight is the number of runs you score. Below that, we took inspiration from the grad chart, which is your partnership chart. Again, the y-axis, as I mentioned, overs is your common denominator. So we reused the same x-axis as before and uh, plotted the partnerships. Now, let's understand again, uh, data uh, when you are trying to visualize data, do not show all your data in one go. Right? You need to focus down on what the storyline is, You know how the data is flowing. And any extra information that you want to show should be either through zooming or interactivity. That is hovers, right? Um, so when we when we had started the company, we were making the mistake of trying to show all the information, and increasingly we are working towards zooming and interactivity. So in our case, we put in this case we put a lot of information in the uh, interactivity part. So this is the end result. Um, actually, I show you live. Show it to you live. Mm. The is, yeah. okay, so uh, these are the two innings. Uh, this is, as I mentioned earlier, oops. the overs, the bowler per over, the current two batsmen who are batting. Uh, the fours and sixes are highlighted, the ones and twos are dulled out, dulled out. Uh, whites and no balls are written out there, wickets are red in color. Uh, uh, sorry. This is the partnership of the current batsman, this is the current ball. Right, and let's say if I want to see the full scorecard, I just click here and the full scope of partnerships are visible now.
and one nice thing I want to show is how, sorry, if you look at the current batsman, okay, it's, uh, let's go back to the presentation then. Right, the current batsman, you saw the zoomed in version, right? Uh, the, all the other batsmen were dulled and greyed out, but we used color to highlight the current two batsmen. So use color to highlight your data. Uh, what else? Now interactivity. The moment you hover over the bowler, you will see, uh, by the way, this is the current ball by ball commentary on the top. Uh, when you hover over the bowler, you will see only the overs that he has bowled. Right, so this is M. Johnson. You will see the only the four overs that he bowled. All the all the other balls are hidden. So you no, now know what his bowling statistics were. Plus we'll have a pop up here, show, not a pop up, a tool tip showing like the strike rate and the wickets and all of that stuff. If I hover over the batsman, I'll see only the balls that he's batted, not the other balls. And again, we have the statistics. If I want to look at the fact that who hit this four, I'll hover over this. The commentary will change to that ball. The batsman will be highlighted and the bowler will be highlighted. So interactivity to focus on uh, finer details. Um, right, so if you start comparing this, it's way too smaller, right? It's, it's really small. There's less reading, less scro scrolling and more awareness. And the best uh, comment that we got from a reader was, it took two minutes for me to figure it out, but once I figured it out, there's no going back. It was, right, so, uh, Let's look at another example, election counting day. Uh, right, so let's look at the data set. Uh, so again, we did this for first post, we were managing the election counting day. Um, India has like lots of regional parties and two national parties. You have election counting day where you have this concept of leading and one. Uh, uh, data properties, you have hierarchical relationship between alliance and party. Uh, one is confirmed and leading is like transient, you are not sure if they won. Uh, what were the readers looking for in this election? They were looking at how badly would say UPA lose, how big would be the BJP victory and how big would be the impact of up. Right? So again we know what are the data sets to focus on. And real world facts that we can use for design inspiration, BJP is a right wing party, up is a left wing party and the Sansad is like a semicircle. Like the actual parliament hall where they discuss. So what are the implications of this? Seats becomes a weight, the hierarchical re relationship becomes a tree, the one and the leading becomes a group. Uh, the fact that people are looking at only these key points, we can club all other parties into others and just like reduce the clutter. Next, uh, we can put, if the Sansad is the, the semicircle, then we can put BJP here, which is a right wing, and up, which is a left wing party, put them here. So placement is also taken care of. Now let's look at choosing the right chart. We had a grouped weighted tree chart, right? That's what the data said. So this is what we can choose from. Now since it's a semicircle, we anyways had to use a sunburst. There's no other option. This was the sunburst, right? Let's focus. So this is what we did. Uh, so uh, what we've done here is, uh, so actually, you know, let's go back. So the sunburst is generally a tree chart. You start from the root at the center and you're going towards the leaves towards the outside, right? Um, let's look here. Uh, now you have these alliances out here on the outside, the parties out here in the inside. When you start hovering, you will see the actual uh, values of who's winning leading. You've broken it into groups. That is the dark blue is the one, which is concrete data and the light Transparentish blue is the leading data. ARP is towards the leftmost, BJP is towards the rightmost. BJP plus, by the way, stands for NDA. We didn't want to use technical terms. Okay. Uh, now, one problem, uh, if you realize uh, here the root is starting from the innermost and the leaves are outside. So initially when we built this chart, the alliances were inside and the parties were outside. Right? That's, the, that's what D3 allows you to do. But then we realized the most important thing in elections in India, uh, we didn't assume that BJP will get all the tickets, uh, the seats. We, the most important thing is, is your alliance winning, right? So if the most important data point is if the alliance is winning, the alliance can't be given such a small area, right? The area for parties is way too less. 
right so we actually spent i think some 200% more time redoing the whole chart breaking d3's uh, design patterns okay by putting the parent node outside and the children inside so now the root is actually the whole thing the next leaf is the alliances and then you have the children the leaves right so this is uh, what we did for election so again the idea here is that how do you see your data set how do you identify what needs to be done look at the options that are available and then start uh, bending those to actually give you the result you want it's out here so uh, summary for data visualization is uh, study the properties and relationships of your data set it is very important you can't start by saying i want a pie chart and then look at your data you need to look at your data and then decide second use your visual encodings very wisely like very very important otherwise you will get clutter uh, right so this is the visualization bit now i'll get into challenges with data journalism right so these are the various steps in data journalism according to us uh, typically you do data collection then you like clean the data model the data visualize the data write the story and the journalist is involved in all of these steps the developer is in some of them and the designer is in some of them right uh, now according to us at pikey there are two formats of data uh, journalism the first is data driven stories data driven stories are stories that revolve around current affairs so this is something that india spin uh, fact checker which is a part of india spin it's a mumbai based data journalism venture uh, what they did was uh, after the padayu rape case they found legit data around crime against dalit analyzed the data plotted the data and wrote a story around it so data driven stories are typically things that uh, are very connected to uh, current affairs this is a visualization app a visualization app is a planned project for a pre planned activity it's a massive project right you start collecting the data modeling the data identifying unknown parameters design it build it out uh, it takes a lot of time right so let's go back to our steps data driven stories are generally things that journalists do themselves you you can't have a developer coming in to say that tomorrow morning i need to write an article they probably not be able to even sc scrape data that quickly whereas visualization apps all of them are involved so the challenges with data journalism are how can you quickly access the appropriate data set which uh, john ear is helping with how do you quickly analyze this data set and how do you quick consistently churn out neat charts and graphs and maps this is, that is what data wrapper is handling right um, other challenges would be um, how do you model data like so like ipl data the cricket score or maybe stock market data or maybe election counting day all the data is coming live it's like every second and every minute but it needs to be remodeled to fit your visualization how do you model it that quickly right um how do you do seo for visualization have you thought about it like when we did these charts these this data is sitting inside svg elements right and google does not read it that well how do you S do the seo for it it's a problem right how do you handle high traffic these visualizations are extremely heavy right um and from pikey's perspective uh, our problem is how do we consistently build beautiful real time visualizations so the beauty is important and real time aspect is very important right so what have we done we have uh, built a in house tool for ourselves uh, we typically use this to simplify our lives uh, right so the first thing that we've done is the principle around which we've done this is instead of waiting for data to be standardized we want to make large scale high velocity multi format data extraction durable right so we've moved towards from writing just a web scraper for one site towards a complete infrastructure of how do you manage and pull data right it's uh, uh, for the developers here it's driven around event machines uh, it's built around event machines the second thing is instead of expecting our data users and journalists to have analytical skills how do we simplify exploration of large data sets so i'll give you the example of census uh hopefully the website will come by the way this is the donut drop it it's not looking proper out here but the idea again was let's look at it. okay 
Okay, let's look at um, stories actually here. Right, so uh, the idea is that you can, there's a pretty heavy data set and we are filtering the data pretty live, if you can see. And so a journalist, there are more charts below, uh, the journalist can actually just see that uh, what are the lighting sources in various states, you'll go and cl click on UP, click schedule cast, schedule tribe, see that around 80% of the homes in UP for scheduled tribes is lit by, uh, what do you call, uh, kerosene, whereas you go to Gujarat and 80% is lit by electricity. So how do you explore a large data set? You build a data explorer dashboard on top of it. Let's get back to this. Right, so simplify exploration of large data sets. You build these explorer dashboards to automate extraction of metadata from data sets. Uh, uh, this is very important. Um, when data comes in, you don't know what the data is, and um, if you don't, if your computer does not understand the data, you are in trouble, right? So we build engines to understand, given a data set, is this geographic data? Is it a date? Is it this? Is it that? We have dictionaries around this, which helps us clean the data and model the data, right? So uh, you need to understand the metadata yourself. Sorry, the computer needs to understand the metadata itself. Next, you need to do assisted data standardization. So uh, let's say if somebody is writing, uh, you know, the data is like yes and true, right? Both are Boolean. We understand it, but should, the machine should understand it. If the data is tomorrow and 2nd of March and an actual date, how will the machine understand that all of them are actually dates? So we have tools around standardization of data. Um, and finally, we have tools for assisted analysis. So uh, there's this nice story that India spent covered uh, about how the stolen cars in Bombay generally are Scorpios and fancy cars. So what they actually did was they took the data set of stolen cars, analyzed that there's either a cluster or an outlier. Right? The story always re revolves around clusters and outliers. So you find the to find a cluster and outlier, you need programs. Like, of course, you can do it manually, uh, but if you have a program which will say that, okay, this is all well distributed, this is what you need to focus on, then the journalists will be way happy. Okay. Um, third point, instead of expecting data users and journalists to, uh, that they'll visualize the data correctly, now that the engine has picked up the metadata, can you do metadata-driven visualization, right? So if it's ordinal data, then you should use saturation levels, that is opacity, to communicate using color. If it's categorical data, or let's say if you're using uh, pie charts, and the area, the number of values that you have are very high, then it should say, please don't use pie charts, right? So uh, you need to, you know, uh, understand that again, uh, the machine needs to understand that metadata drives visualization. So you should take those smart decisions. So I'll give you another example. So if you have uh, data that you've plotted only for uh, Western European countries, and the only other map that you have is that of world map, right? Then your map, the visualization engine should automatically zoom into Western Europe, right? Because the rest of the world is irrelevant, right? You have only data for that. So how do you do that? The engine should do it. Uh, other examples, uh, with journalism plus plus we are also experimenting with the data driven blog. Most uh, news sites are like WordPress, which is an article driven uh, engine. How do you do data driven journalism? Do you have the, uh, does your journalist have the tools to actually just explore data, plot it, do this, do that, and quickly get the story out? For that you need a data driven blog. Um, next we use tools like configuration editor, this again something that we built in house. Uh, the problem that we are facing is that journalists and businesses and clients always want things to be configurable and developers always want things to be like us here here. The reason for that is that uh, everything that you want to make configurable is a new structure in the database and you're creating new tables, you're creating new models, you don't know how it's going to impact, your design becomes unnecessarily clunky. So what we've done is we've built a tool called as configuration editor where you, like the business guy, that is the journalist, goes in and says that I want the background color to be configurable. The SEO guy says that I want the metadata to come. I should be able to edit it myself. The meta tag should be this thing uh, configurable. They just add a list. Automatically, that whole data set gets stored in a JSON file for us, right? And then there is a, it's like Google Forms, right? It takes that metadata, generates a form that they can fill up, again go, goes into the JSON file, 
when they press publish, it goes to the CDN. Now the program that we are writing is picking it up, and all of these values have got defaults, so the visualization works seamlessly, and they can just change everything. So the the problem is that as um, we are doing data journalism, and these news organizations work at really high velocity, like it's scary, like. They are so like it has to be done by this time. The story will become stale, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How do you build tools that are designed around, you know, making data journalism easy? So these are some of our experiments. Uh, right, one thing that we've learned: we started off as a visualization company, and we are increasingly becoming data and visualization company. We never planned to become, like, never planned to use NoSQL or in memory databases etc or nlp but uh, we need to do it right so data journalism really involves analyzing your data set so if you another example that avinash took was <coughs> like uh, press releases coming out right you need to have an nlp in engine to analyze it right um, or let's say uh, so let's think of it this way uh, let's plot the tweets of narendra modi right pre election and uh, tweets of uh, Arvind Kejriwal, and you have like line charts, four line charts. One line chart is positive tweets, positive sentiment tweets of Modi, and negative sentiment tweets of Modi, like what people are talking around Narendra Modi, not his tweets. And you have positive sentiment tweets of Kejriwal and negative sentiment tweets of Kejriwal. And now you take all of that data, you uh, run an NLP engine on all the historical news that is being plotted in your news company, like uh, uh, like all the articles that you have, and you understand that which after which article, that is which event in real world, the tweets that is the Twitter communication shifted from positive to negative for a certain political leader, right? That is NLP, that's like hardcore NLP. Or let's say if um, you have a presidential side election where it's Kejriwal, Modi, and Rahul Gandhi. And somebody's talking about um, somebody stands for secularism, somebody stands for communalism, etc., etc. There are these standard notions that we have of people and political leaders. Can we actually take the text of their speeches, crunch it uh, using NLP, and understand are they actually talking about secularism? Are they actually talking about uh, communalism? This is also NLP. So, data gen. Uh, natural language processing. Yes. So uh, you take the speech of the text and analyze, convert it into numbers, basically, right? Analy 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 analytics, yes. So we started off as a visualization company and increasingly we are becoming a data analytics and visualization company. I think that's it. Some a fun fact, the name Pikey comes from a captcha. <laughs> so when I started the company, somebody wanted to buy something, I wanted to sell something, I didn't have money. And I didn't have time to actually plan the name of the company. I thought it came from your circle. No, no, no. So just use the CAPTCHA to name the company. Till we do what we decided that day was, till we do good work, it doesn't matter what we are calling it. It's actually a very nice way to not waste time on deciding. Yeah. Because that's we thought of Sanskrit words and Gujarati word. words and then English words and started looking for an African language and like, yeah. okay, okay, this, yeah. is, this is getting like really crazy. <laughs> yeah. So this is it. So the tools you are used, to, yeah. you are using third party libraries or the backstage you are calling. It's 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 in all. As and when we face problems, we know we are going to fall. Like certain cases, uh, like many times the expected traffic for a certain event was X, but we got like three X or four X or five X, right? Or the data coming in was like at a higher velocity than we could handle, and we failed. So what we did was overnight we cooked up something which is going to next time help us analyze it better. So actually I can give you a, I have a one of the very early versions of the tool. If you want a demo, I can. Sure, sure. It's a website, so I don't know if you'll see it. Let's see. Yeah, it's right here. Let's get rid of this. So this is the first prototype of that configuration editor that we cooked up. So let's go this. Right, so let's say label what I can't see. What is the background color? 
uh, BG color, right? I go text, yeah, text. And I want color. It's all uh, around HTML5. I take this. I go to my is the this one's favorite. How do you do this? How do you change? Okay. Now, okay. Okay, yeah, this is much better. Right, so now I press here and we have what is the background color? Right? Okay, I can see the tooltip, like the color selector out here. Right, so background color is red. So, and now you save it, it goes in the value of the same JSON. What have we done? We've effectively eliminated the need for changing databases. Right? Journalists and the SEO guys and the business guys can decide what is configurable and it's configurable. But were they able to decide the dimensions of the type of returns? No. Or was it uh, That is, uh, I'll come to that. But this is only for configuration. This is like the PyQ configuration editor. Right? Uh, sorry. So let's look at this. Uh, let's go to data sets. I want to explain the concept of workers. Uh, when you start pulling data at really high velocity, uh, it becomes a problem because you don't know what is failing. Is the NSE you know, API a problem? Like, is the uh, cricket scorecard feed a problem, or is your processing a problem? What's what's going on? So let's look at this worker. It's a test worker. Uh, basically, every data set in PyQ has got workers associated with it. And you go in and it was so basically it did the fetch that is did the web scrapping or did API pulling or whatever that is identify that in 0 0.2 uh, 1 2 seconds it fetched so much how many records it fetched if there's an error and then uh, did the processing that is the cleaning the saving the modeling so with this we are able to do live modeling and then sometimes when you need to push live data to CDNs it will do the live push so we know which step is failing now. For a typical IPA match, you know, like we have lots of these things working like in like seconds. So we can monitor things very quickly. Uh, if we don't have these tools, then what will happen is that we'll write something in PHP, it'll be in PHP, it'll be working in PHP. There's no way to monitor all of this. Or Ruby and Rails for that matter. Right, so now let's analyze an actual data set. Let's pull PyKey Twitter, which has no data, and let's say it has to refresh automatically every 4,000 seconds. Again, I, I don't know if it's going to work or no. It's a very early prototype. Let's see. It's supposed to be a image here. Yeah, no. So I can click on it once the image comes. We see the workers. No, this was a test. Okay, so basically we go back to that same page, see that the first fetch worker worked in so much seconds, it pulled how much data and then was the modeling done. You can see the data there. And to, in case you have to like do it for real time, how you put it is it like for the IPL? No, it's all, it's live, it's, it's pulling the data, right, from some place. So, so doing the polling or? Yeah, yeah. no, it's, uh, so again, if you, uh, without this system, we would fetch, keep polling data, new data without modeling it, because modeling takes a longer period of time. And then that, that would get like stacked up and then something would fail, right? So now how this works is you do fetch, you do modeling, right? You push it to the CDN and push to CDN as a separate worker and then you start fetching again. No, so that works in parallel. In case of your example, yes. you cannot every time do the like you know, fetch, fetch or take the fetch. You do it like doing the polling? No, no, uh, polling is on this uh, front end. The data needs to be modeled, 
right? I think elections is a better example for me. So once this is done, it would then go to the next stage, the next stage, the next stage. Uh, right. What we can't see here right now is the visualization layer. Uh, what would oh, you know? What I can show one more. Thing. So let's call this demo. Let's call this country GDP uh, life. I don't know road accidents. Some some kind of index and uh, is I don't know safe place. And finally, last updated data. Okay. Let's look at India. Some random GDP load index. Let's call this Y. Let's call this uh, updated yesterday. Let's call Somalia. Balls. Right, so now we've taken a date column which is in text, we've taken boolean column which is in random boolean standards. Let's hopefully it'll work. Let's see if the worker ran. Right, so again, uh, this is a UI error, but despite the fact it was Y and true and false, random data, it, it has been the probability of it being boolean. So it is extracted metadata. Despite the fact that this is yesterday and something something, it knows its date type. So this is smart extraction of metadata. And now, what is assisted standardization? The fact that we know that this is not standardized data, but it is date time, so we can convert it. We can take today minus one becomes yesterday. So, yeah. So can it work on the standard also? Yeah. So that's the uh, objective, right? If you have geo data, if you have all the uh, country data, it should convert it to ISO 2 codes. Right? It should find clusters. So, yeah, I think that's it.